Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Vast better. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Deputy Principal, Mr. Dean, Dr. Pank Sapa, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, when Dr. Reddock said I was becoming a legend uh, this afternoon when they named the building after me, I made the comment that those kinds of things only happen after you're dead. Uh, I made the comment that when in Barbados there was a stamp struck, and my image struck on it, and my grandchildren said to me, but they only do those things to you when you're dead. Uh, but I'm very much alive so far. I have to thank the Institute for Gender Studies for inviting me to give this lecture this evening, and especially uh, Rhoda Reddock. She was the initiator of this in inviting me to speak on this topic after we had a couple of discussions about the matter. I'm in the Caribbean. Anytime I speak here of health issues, even with the slightest relation to women, I always refer to one of my favorite women, Nita Barrow, who was one of my heroines. Many know her primarily as a champion of women's causes and her stellar work as president of the YWCA and her leadership of the historic women's conference in Nairobi. These are all well chronicled. But her seminal activities in the field of health are equally stellar. She held many senior posts in the nursing profession, both nationally and internationally. But perhaps the one which had the greatest impact globally was that of director of the Christian Medical Commission. That commission was formed by the World Council of Churches to give effect to the concern that health and healing should be a fundamental part of the church's mission. And the evolution of that thinking into concern for the health of and by the people was one of the factors that influenced Halfton Mahler, then Director General of WHO, to articulate the concept of primary health care. Indeed, the term primary health care was first used by the Commission. I always point that out because we in the Caribbean sometimes don't recognize when things of global significance are generated by our citizens. Uh, Dame Nita Barra was president, and Cynthia and Talbot from Guyana was secretary of the, of the, of the Commission and there were major forces in moving the commission in that, di in that direction. Nita saw health very much as a manifestation of social conditions, and I've quoted before one of her many speeches on health and social injustice. And Nita said, in many parts of the world, the distribution of land, the inability of the rural sector to feed itself, the scarcity of employment opportunities, the lack of basic domestic and sanitary convenience, and other pressures arising from social injustice, these constitute the greatest threat to public health. The subject of the people's participation in the delivery of primary health is crucial to the justice and sustainability of the social system as it relates to health. I want you to note for future reference the concept of justice and how she referred to it so often. Because on several occasions when she discussed health and injustice with me, she would refer to the particular plight of women and the extent to which they were disadvantaged. I'd also like to recognize the pioneering work in this field of persons like Peggy Anchebus, Jocelyn Messiah, Elsa Leah Riney, and the current group of academics like Eudine Barreto, Christine uh, Barrow, Rhoda Reddock, Pat Muhammad, Vereen Shepherd, and Barbara Bailey, among others, who stimulated me to give this lecture and contributed to much of my own thinking in the area of health and gender. When I was asked to give the lecture, I contemplated whether I should have a PowerPoint presentation, because in general, PowerPoint presentations are easier. Uh, in a sense, you can almost wing it in a, with a PowerPoint presentation. But I decided that the topic was so important, and uh, the institute was so important, I should give more thought to presenting a studied argument about some of the topics which I'm going to address, rather than having a PowerPoint presentation. In addition to the PowerPoint presentation, you have to turn the lights off so you can sleep, and I don't want that to happen. <laughs> Let me affirm at the outset that I have no intention of entering the list over the topics of fe female or male marginalization as such. This is beyond my competence and the time I have been allotted. My more prosaic intention is to describe some of my own thinking, the evolution of some of my own thinking on gender and health, and set out some of the health problems which have their foundation in gender, and point out some of the pitfalls to be avoided 
and the steps to be taken to reduce some of the health inequities that arise from gender discrimination. This must not distract attention from the many major health problems that affect men and women generally or because of their biological sex, but rather to pay attention to some of those which arise from gender considerations. Perhaps my first introduction to thinking about gender and its possible relationship to health and medicine, this occurred when I was professor of medicine and a group of my students, female medical students, presented me with a copy of Jeremiah Greer's The Female Eunuch. And I've never been clear if this was a silent rebuke or whether it was a kind of thank you for my understanding and appreciation of some of the issues and problems they faced as they tried to come to grips with the profession, which was at, at that time basically male-dominated. But I was fascinated and a bit taken aback by Greer's flaming rhetoric and by Norman Mailer's response to her as well. And what I considered then an almost revolutionary approach to change in human relations. I marveled that she dismissed almost nonchalantly the pioneering work of the early feminists as being insufficient and almost a barrier to acquiring the kind of justice and liberation that were necessary for women's advancement. But I'm reading it, reading it now, I'm less alarmed and I'm more struck with a firm view that it was necessary to be specific and was necessary not to be general, but identify the nature of the difference, the nature of the inequality, before assigning a gender bias and trying to correct it. My more intimate contact with women's organizations and gender was as director of the Pan American Health Organization. And I took great pride in our program on women health and development. It was a, a very good program. I insisted then that the name be such and many of my colleagues wished to have it called Gender Health and Development, but I resisted and insisted that it be Women Health and Development because I took the view that while I accepted then that gender discrimination affected men as well, the impact on women, impact on women was that much greater. It was so great, I thought, that it deserved maintaining the title of Women Health and, 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 and Development. But the, well, the idea of women health and development or gender development is an interesting concept in, 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 in itself. But one of the challenges I always found was to keep a fix on gender dimensions of health and less on the health of women that derive from their, uh, from their biology. The tendency always was to discuss women's health rather than discuss the gender aspect of health. It's critical to have health statistics disaggregated by sex as that was the first step towards establishing the difference and therefore those aspects that were gendered. Although this, through this program and since, I've come to have some much better understanding of the currents of feminist thought and have arrived at the rather prosaic conclusion that in spite of the various forms of interpretation of the issues and the various sociological constructs, what underpinned most feminine thinking was the basic objective of acquiring political, social, and economic equality for women and, and men. The biological differences should not enter judgment of individual strength or weaknesses. I was att attracted by the recent World Bank report on gender equality and development because that deals with gender equality as a core development objective, a core development objective. And the World Bank bases the work on a definition of gender with which I'm comfortable. It says gender refers to the social, behavioral, and cultural attributes, expectations, and norms associated with being a man or a woman. We are born male or female, but we are acculturated into the different gender roles by societal custom and practice. But before entering into the relationship more deeply between gender and health, I must relate a personal incident which demonstrated for me the pervasiveness and the perniciousness of the gender dimensions of health. Gender discrimination is pervasive and powerful to the point where it enters into areas that might properly be designated as within the biological role of women and thus not subject to gender, dis to, 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 to gender discrimination. I visited a clinic in a rural area in which PAHO was supporting a project on maternal health. And the head of the clinic related the story of a young woman who had started a hemorrhage towards the end of her pregnancy. 
The hemorrhage grew worse. But she did not go to the near, nearby hospital for attention, but she stayed at home and bled to death. And when I asked why, I was told she couldn't go because she had to have her husband's permission to do so. And by the time the husband arrived home, she was dead. I commented on the case initially as one of inadequate services that have led and still unfortunately still continue to lead throughout the world to high maternal mortality. But the head of the clinic with quivering voice replied that it was a most horrible manifestation of gender inequity. Such was the level of male dominance in that society that it overshadowed the basic dictates of self-preservation. This was a lesson that the construct of gender appears even in the discharge of roles that are eminently within the biological domain of women. I am sympathetic to the view articulated by some feminists that focus on individual or particular aspects of gender inequality is simply playing at the margins and we need a radical transformation of the way the world addresses its major problem, which is injustice in its many guises. We need a transformational movement led by women in which the value of solidarity posed as a quintessential feminine characteristic will be the banner of the new army. But my gaze is rather fixed on the less ambitious and perhaps reductionist target of addressing those health issues of which I have some knowledge and establishing how improvement in understanding and addressing them might come by viewing them through a gender lens. Of course, I must make the point as sharply as I can that gender considerations of health are not primarily or exclusively a feminist issue. I chose the topic healthy gender is healthy nigh deliberately in a, in, in, in a sense because I've been intrigued by the arguments, some arguments in the feminist literature on the need for degendering society. But the more elegant proponents of, proponents of this, Judith Laura, who writes very well, makes the point that there's a general acceptance of the proposition that gender inequality is unjust and unfair, and as the most egregious form of inequity is a break to human development, we agree. But there are, she poses two approaches to this. There can be equality of the genders, or there can be a complete abolition of the category of gender as a social category thus eliminating the need for equalization. If you abolish the category of gender as a social category, you will eliminate the need for equalization. And she comes down on the desirability of the latter and argues fairly persuasively that the time has come to rebel against gender as a social categorization and thus dismantle the social institution of gender by degendering society. The reality of the multiple perspectives and the social statuses of humans makes the binary categorization irrelevant at best and damaging at worst. This is her argument. And she writes, when we no longer ask boy or girl in order to start gendering an infant, when the information about genitalia is as irrelevant as the color of the child's eyes but not yet the color of skin, then and only then will men and women be socially interchangeable and really equal. I found the argument entertaining, but I have my doubts as to whether we will reach this nirvana. As Barry Chavan states bluntly, every known society organizes many, if not most, or, or all human activities along lines of gender and orders the relations between males and females in a manner that places females in a position subordinate to males. However, and this is important. I believe that the world is filled with examples of gender inequality and gender discrimination that can indeed be corrected even if the category of gender remains. So this evening, I wish to deal principally with health. And my thesis is fundamentally different from that of Judith Lorber's. I contend that if one is to alter the inequity inherent in gender differences in health, one first has to start from the conviction that such differences have evolved and are not immutable. That's a fundamental point I wish to make. It can be asked whether gender discrimination arises as a result of biological differentiation and difference in reproductive roles and differences in physical attributes as a, right, as a result of the sex difference may be at the root of the social construct that is gender. 
And really it is that societal organization of roles over the millennia have done nothing more than adapt to these biological differences. And certain societal values have changed more rapidly than others. And in this sense, our concern for equity and gender, equity and gender justice, these concerns have evolved more rapidly than those values which assign an unfavorable role to females. This is an important point I'm trying to make, that our change in appreciation of values and norms don't change, uh, all don't change simultaneously, but the societal values uh, change uh, uh, differentially, and our concern for equity and justice, these have evolved more rapidly than those values which assign an unfavorable role to females. Societal value systems are not universal, and in general, Western value systems, which I know better, are currently accepting, albeit slowly, that gender must not be a social determinant which impacts negatively on any aspect of human well-being. This thesis, of course, relates predominantly to gender considerations as they affect female health, but there's also now, universal acceptance that seeing gender as a social determinant as related only to females is of limited value. Gender considerations enter into discussion of male health as well. So if one denies the relevance of gender in addressing health equities, then one will not succeed in improving health individually or collectively for both females and males. Gender has to be seen as a structural determinant of health in that it produces differential exposures to risks and vulnerabilities. Viewed only through the lens of social determinants, the gender aspect of health is one of the more difficult aspects to address. Why? Other social determinants, such as poverty, urbanization, are relatively easy to identify and quantify and thus lend themselves to proposals for changes in policy. But gender is more subtle and in a sense more difficult as the other social determinants such as urbanization and poverty are themselves gendered. And poverty is the obvious one. An important step, however, is defining and removing, an important step in defining and removing inequity is establishing the inequalities, the differences, not all inequalities or differences are unjust and beyond the agents are not all inequalities or difference are unjust or unfair and beyond the agency of those involved and are therefore manifestations of inequity. Not all inequality is inequity. In that sense, if one degenders health, one fails to, if one fails to take account of gender, then one is doomed to deny many aspects of health to both men and women. The World Bank report on gender equality and development identifies three dimensions of gender equality. They are the accumulation of endowments, endowments such as education, health, and physical assets, the use of those endowments to take up economic opportunities and generate incomes, the use of those endowments, and the application of those endowments to take act action, or as a sociologist say, agency, which can affect individual and household well-being. These endowments of which the World Bank speaks are very much akin to the capabilities which Amartya Sen posits as a bedrock of the freedom that is necessary for genuine human development. They're interconnected, but I will deal exclusively with health, and not only because it's an area that I know, but because I have long contended that health has both an intrinsic as well as an instrumental value, and the latter has only been recently universally accepted. But I subscribe to the view that health should be valued intrinsically more than other aspects of human development which have little intrinsic social value, such as income. I'll begin with the best known of the differences in health between men and women. Women are sicker, but men die quicker. The difference in life expectancy between men and women is almost a universal phenomenon. And the evidence is strong that there may be some slight biological input. It is a gendered phenomenon. There is no good major intrinsic biological difference present at birth. Professor Rampsak will, will, will tell you that. 
which predisposes women to live longer than men. The gap is seen very clearly here in the Caribbean, where the average life expectancy at birth is 70 years for men and 75.7 for women. There's not much variation between the countries, but the largest gap is in Guyana, where the life expectancy for both sexes is the lowest in the region. And one of the consequences of this differential here is that women have a longer period of widowhood, a long period of widowhood, and often after having cared for a sick partner are left without resources, thus creating the frequently observed problem of the poor elderly widow. And while I said there may be a minor input of biology, it is generally accepted that men die earlier because they have been socialized into forms of behavior that lead to early death, smoking, eating more unhealthy foods, indulging in more risky behavior. And the most risky of these behaviors is violence, and homicide is much commoner in males than females. More men die from heart disease, cancer, and stroke, while diabetes kills more women in the Caribbean, and the latter can possibly be related to the greater prevalence of obesity. The, the mortality from diabetes in the Caribbean is exceeded in the Americas only by Mexico. You mentioned, Madam Chair, the year the people of African descent. One interesting phenomenon that's appearing across the Atlantic is this, that while blood pressure across the world tends to be falling, one of the groups in which blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, is rising is in African females. And we are concerned at what is the basis of this, it is, whether it's differential diet, whether there are other gender factors that are influencing the, uh, this phenomenon with obvious consequences in terms of heart disease, stroke, etc., etc. Women take more careful notice of the symptoms of ill health, and they seek attention more frequently. And men, perhaps because of the false sense that complaining runs counter to the image of the brave and stoic male stereotype, they complain less. This common perception or misperception of the complaining woman often leads to her being misdiagnosed when there is indeed serious illness. And the social construction of masculinity and its hegemonic version may not only induce health damaging behavior that leads to earlier death, but will impact on men seeking help for health. So the denial of weakness, the need to appear strong and powerful, and the idea that soliciting help is feminine all conspire to keep men away from the health services or to attend late. It has also been suggested, and some research suggests this, that because health services are staffed predominantly by females, the need to seek help from them will be yet another denial of hegemonic masculinity. This defect increases in importance in the management of the non-communicable diseases because these diseases require chronic care rather than episodic care. And those persons with these diseases have to come to the health services with some frequency. And if males are not going to come to the health services for the reasons I, adju I adduced above, this has no This is so as well. This other phenomenon doesn't occur in the Caribbean, but I'll still mention it. In Asia, there's clear evidence of female infanticide as female children are valued less than males. And with the growing availability of prenatal sex determination, there's abortion of the female fetus. It is clear that, that, that there are now millions of missing women in Asia because of these practices. The high mortality from heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and stroke has generated considerable concern in the Caribbean. And this region has the distinction of having convened the first ever summit of heads of government here in Port of Spain to address them. And the 15-point declaration from that summit forms a framework for Caribbean action in this area. And so concerned were our heads of government with the problems of these diseases that they mobilized global attention. And we saw the United Nations convene a high-level meeting of the world's heads of government and state in September this year to consider and decide what might be done globally to address them. This has been recognized universally as a major diplomatic coup, a major diplomatic success, success by CARICOM. The political declaration from that meeting recognized, and I quote, the economic, social, gender, 
political, behavioral, and environmental determinants of health are among the contributing factors to the rising incidence and prevalence of these non-communicable diseases. One of the areas that has drawn attention more recently is the role of women in the genesis and treatment of these diseases. It has become clear that maternal nutrition bears close relation to the birth weight of the infant, and the infant's birth weight and nutrition in the first two years have a clear and direct impact on the chances of that infant developing diabetes, becoming obese, or dying from a heart attack. My colleagues tell me that 46% of your chance of developing a chronic disease is at the time you are born. When you are born, you, the, the, the chances of your, 46% of that chance is determined, uh, 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 certainly in the first thousand uh, days of, of, of life. This is an example of biology being affected by gendered behavior, as it is almost universally accepted that the nurturing of the young is usually responsible to the mother. In addition, the exposure to what we have described as the epigenetic factors which affect the development of the infant's predisposition to, the, to these diseases is likely gendered as well. While this knowledge of what is referred to as the developmental origins of health and disease has been hailed as a tremendous advance in our understanding of the genesis of these diseases and the possibility of preventing them, I have a concern that once again we will see that the burden of change will be placed on the woman. It is bad enough to have the responsibility for one's own health, but I view with some concern the pointing of the finger at, woman, at the woman as the agent responsible for the future development of diseases in their offspring. And the charge will be even more grave is if, as is possible, these changes are intergenerational. Unfortunately, the percentage of infants with birth weight, low birth weight in the Caribbean is higher than in any part of the other part of the Americas. But it's not only the genesis of these diseases that may be gendered, but the care of them as well. There's a growing epidemic of childhood obesity in the world, as well as high and increasing prevalence of diabetes. The Caribbean countries figure as in the first seven positions among the Americas in terms of diabetes. And there's a tendency to regard the increasing prevalence of childhood obesity and obesity in general as a function of domestic consumption, and this has been and continues to be the domain of the woman. And one of the standard tenets of neoliberalism is the urge that is to urge individual responsibility to cite the irresponsible, cite the, 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 the difficulty of creating a nanny state, or the undesirability of creating a, a, a nanny state. And in that sense, to put the blame squarely on the individual, in this case, the woman. I believe that the better approach is a classic liberal approach, which takes account of the role of the state Indeed, it is the latter view that is gaining traction internationally. An emphasis is being placed not, only, not solely on the, you don't want to remove all the responsibility from the individual, but not solely on the individual, and principally the woman, but on the state to change the environment to facilitate the healthy choice. And the common risk factors for these diseases are smoking, an unhealthy diet, and the harmful use of alcohol and physical inactivity. In all of these, the better approach is to insist that the enabling environment be so changed by state action, or rather government action, as to make the healthy choice the easy one. But it's not only in the non-communicable diseases that gender is important. The feminization that uh, our chair, uh, Pat Mohammed mentioned of the AIDS epidemic in the Caribbean is a major cause of concern. And this region has the lowest male to female ratio of AIDS cases in the Americas. And this is the area of health that has perhaps stimulated more gender research than any other. There are several studies from the university, from your institute here, on the female vulnerability to infection with HIV. And the female vulnerability is not only biological, but is enhanced by the power relationships and the male domination in economic, social, and often physical sense. An area, however, which intrigues me relates to the attitudes and practices of young girls. The prevalence rate is rising fast in young girls in the end of the group. And I've been intrigued by the attitudes and practices of young girls with relationship to sexuality and vulnerability to HIV. Christine Barra describes the, sy the syndrome, what she describes as bashment, 
in which there's aggressive display of sexuality by a subset of young girls who have no truck with the societal norms and they use their bodies according to their perception of their own agency. It is not that they do not possess information, but they choose what of it they will, and they choose what of it, of it will affect their behaviors. I have drawn an analogy between uh, these, uh, Christine's distinct, uh, uh, description of bashment. I've drawn an analogy here with uh, the character in the famous song by Althea and Donna, which some Jamaicans may, may know, Uptown Top Ranking. And that, uh, one of the verses from that says, should, oh, should I see me and the ranking dread? Check how we jamming and thing. Love is all I bring in a mikaki suit and thing. No pop, no style, are strictly roots. No pop, no style, are strictly roots. I take these as almost a rejection of the common sub submissive gender roles as uh, assigned by poverty. Thus, we have a double danger, a double whammy. The young female is a victim of male domination and frequently violence, thus causing her to be vulnerable to infection. But when she kicks over the notion of domination and acts out her gender freedom, jamming and thing, she may also be more vulnerable to infection. In this era of HIV, it has become clearer that failure to understand and consider the role of gender in the epidemic will make it impossible to control it, even in the face of the availability of information and treatment. Uh, male circumcision has emerged as a highly effective measure for prevention of transmission of HIV. I think it will be interesting to see the level uptake of this method given the organization of much of uh, masculinity around the penis and the perception of it by the young male as shown, for example, in many, much of the popular music. Now, I have outlined only a few of the gendered aspects of health which could lend themselves to change. And I ask myself whether there can indeed be substantial and significant change. I believe the answer is yes. Why? First, there's historical evidence of change. The gender difference in life expectancy was not present over a century ago. And my colleagues in PAHO point out that change will come when there's empowerment of both men and women. And that will come through transformative programs that acknowledge and value the different norms and roles for men and women and include ways to change these harmful norms. This push for changes of norms and values that drive social movements has usually been fed with the notion or the reality of there being a disadvantaged class, as was the case with the civil rights movement, as is the case with the feminine movement. In one sense, this is applicable to female health, but when the argument is put that gender considerations apply to both men and women, we will need to consider a somewhat different approach to the problem. But I have no doubt that there will be change. But there's another reason, perhaps a, a philosophical reason, why I believe there will be change. I see change as a result of more profound social evolution. The highway of history may meander, but I believe it goes inexorably in the direction of, inequality, of, of equality. I believe that the highway of history leads us inexorably in the direction of equality. The political scientist will say that this finds its best expression in the universal adoption of a liberal democracy as a form of political and social organization. And this thrust for this form of social organization has been, is contended. It lies in what originally Plato and certainly Hegel would describe as humankind's commitment to what, is, what, 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 what they describe as a thymotic struggle and drive. Plato says that our soul, part of our soul, is a thymos. That is a part of our soul that makes us struggle. And that a drive for recognition and the drive for dignity is the force behind the move towards justice and fairness. It's that thymotic struggle that uh, humankind has within, coming from within our soul that makes us strive for, 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 for justice and fairness. Uh, tomorrow is Diwali, and isn't it so that uh, uh, the return of Lord Rama was just for this purpose, the search for justice and fairness. Another facilitating factor is that the world is moving slowly, I think surely, to recognizing that soft power, which is essentially in the feminine domain, will remain hard power, 
with his masculine visage as a means of influence. But more prosaically and more to home, and more to the point locally, I am chair that our university, and specifically your institute, is dedicating time and thought to these issues. The one small request I would make of you is that this concept of gender and how it affects health in both men and women does find a place in the training of all personnel, specifically the health personnel. Madam Chair, it was Gladstone who said, justice delayed is justice denied. And the truth of Gladstone's uh, dictum has been well validated. And I trust it will be similar recognition. That recognition will attend the concept that health degendered is health denied. Thank you. <clears throat>